Hello, everybody. Today, I'll be speaking with John Wentworth, an independent AI alignment researcher who focuses on formalizing abstraction. For links to what we're discussing, you can check the description of this episode, and you can read the transcripts at axrp.net. Well, welcome to AXRP, John. Thank you. Thank you to our live studio audience for showing up today. Um, so I guess the first thing I'd like to ask is, I see you as being interested in resolving confusions around agency or things that we don't understand about agency. So what don't we understand about agency? Oof. All right. Well, let's, let's start like chronologically from where I started. I started out first sort of two directions in parallel. Uh, one of them was in biology, like systems biology and to some extent synthetic biology, mm. looking at uh, E. coli. And biologists always describe E. coli as like collecting information from their environment and using that to keep a sort of internal model of what's going on with the world and then making decisions based on that in order to achieve good things. So yeah. they're using these very agency-loaded intuitions to understand what's going on with the E. coli. But the actual models they have are just sort of like these simple dynamical systems, occasionally with some feedback loops in there. They don't have a way to like take the sort of low-level dynamics of the E. coli and back out these uh, sort of agency primitives that they're talking about, like goals and world models and stuff. Sorry, E. coli, it's a single-celled organism, yes. right? Is the claim that the single cells mm -hmm. are like taking in information about their environment and like, yes. right? One simple example of this is chemotaxis. So you've right. got this E. coli, it's swimming around uh, in like a, a little pool of water and you drop in a sugar molecule and there will be a sort of chemical gradient of sugar that like drops off as you move away from the, the grain of sugar. And the E. coli will attempt to swim up that gradient, uh, which is actually an interesting problem because when you're at a, a length scale that small, the E. coli's measurements of the sugar gradient are extremely noisy. Yeah, so yeah. it actually has to do pretty good tracking of that sugar gradient over time to keep track of whether it's swimming up the gradient or down the gradient. And, and is, it, is it using some momentum algorithm, or is it just accepting the high variance and hoping it'll wash out over time? Uh, it is essentially a momentum algorithm. Okay, yeah. which is basically like uh, roughly, yeah, continuing to move in the direction it used to move, uh, yes. something like that. Basically, if the, it tracks the sugar concentration over time, and if it's trending upwards, it keeps swimming. And if it's trending downwards, it just sort of stops and tumbles in place and then goes in a random direction. And it, this, is, this is enough for it. Like if you drop a sugar molecule in a tray of E. coli, they will all end up converging towards that sugar molecule pretty quickly. Sorry, not molecule, sugar cube. Sure. So how could a single cell organism do that? I mean, it's got 30,000 genes. There's a lot of stuff going on in there. The specifics in this case, what you have is there's this little sensor for sugar, and there's like a few other things it also keeps track of. Uh, it's this, this molecule on the surface of the cell, and it will attach phosphate groups to that molecule. And it will detach those phosphate groups at a regular rate and attach them whenever it senses like a sugar molecule or whatever. So you end up with the equilibrium number of... Uh, sugar mo of uh, phosphate molecules on there is sort of tracking what's going on with the sugar outside. And then there's a adaptation mechanism so that like if the sugar concentration is just staying high, the number of phosphates on each of these molecules will sort of drop back to baseline. But if the sugar concentration is increasing over time, the number of phosphates will stay at a high level. And if it's decreasing over time, the number of phosphates will stay at a low level. Oh, okay. So it can keep track of whether concentrations are increasing or decreasing as it's swimming. Mm. And, so, and so somehow it's using the structure of the fact that it has a boundary and it can just like, you know, have stuff on the boundary that represents stuff that's happening at like that yep. point of the boundary and then it can move in a direction yep. that it can sort of sense. Yep. And then obviously there's like some biochemical signal processing downstream of that, but like that's the basic idea. Okay. All right, that's pretty interesting. So, uh, but you were saying that you were learning about E. coli mm -hmm. and I guess biologists would say that it had it was like making inferences and had goals and something, mm -hmm. but their models of the E. coli were very simple dynamical systems. Yep. And I imagine you were going to say something going from there. Yeah. So then, like, you end up with these giant dynamical systems models where, like, it, it's very much like looking at the inside of a neural net. Like, you've got these huge systems that just aren't very interpretable, and like intuitively, it seems like it's doing agency stuff, but we don't have a good way to go from like the the low-level dynamical systems representation to like it's trying to do this, it's modeling the world like that. So that was that was the biology angle. I was also at around the same time looking at markets through a similar lens, like financial markets. And the 
the the question that got me started down that route was you've got like the efficient market hypothesis saying that you know these these financial markets are extremely inexploitable you're not going to be able to get any money out of them okay and then you've got the coherence theorems saying like when you've got a system that does trades and stuff and you can't pump any money out of it that means it's an expected utility maximizer okay so then like obvious question What's the utility function and the Bayesian model for a financial market, right? Hmm. Like the coherence theorems are telling me they should have one. And if I could like model this financial market as being an expected utility maximizer, that would make it a lot simpler to reason about in a lot of ways, right? Like it'd yep. be a lot simpler to answer various questions about what it's going to do or like how it's going to work. Sure. So I dug into that for a while uh, and eventually ran across this result called non-existence of a representative agent. Okay. Which says that, lo and behold, even ideal financial markets, despite your complete inability to get money out of them, they are not expected utility maximizers. So what, what axioms of the coherence theorems do they violate? So the coherence theorems implicitly assume that there's no path dependence in your preferences. And it turns out that once you allow for path dependence, you can have a, a system which is inexploitable but is, does, does not have a, an equivalent utility function. Uh, so for instance, in, in a financial market, what could happen is, uh, so you've got Apple and Google stocks, and you start out with a market that's holding like 100 shares of each. So you've got like this market of traders, and mm. in aggregate, they're holding 100 shares each of Apple and Google. Okay, and this just means that like Apple has issued 100 stocks and Google has issued 100 stocks, right? So in principle, there could be some stocks held by entities that are outside of the market. That like, just like never trade? Exactly. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah. And I guess in practice, probably like founder in, shares. Or in practice, like there's, there's just tons of institutions that hold things long term and never trade. So they're like out of equilibrium with the market most of the time. Okay. But anyway, you've got like everyone that's in the market and sort of keeping in equilibrium with each other and trading with each other regularly. Hmm. Uh, they're holding 100 shares each. Now they trade for a while and they end up with 150 shares of Apple and 150 shares of Google in aggregate, right? All right. And then the question is, like, at what prices are they willing to continue trading? So, like, how much are they willing to trade off between Apple and Google? Are, you, are they willing to trade one share of Apple for one share of Google? Are they willing to trade two shares of Apple for one share of Google? Like, what's, what trade-offs are they willing to accept? And it turns out that what can happen is depending on the path by which this market went from... 100 shares of Apple and 100 shares of Google to 150 shares of Apple and 100 shares of Google, 150 shares of Google. Uh, one path might end up with them willing to accept a two to one trade. The other path might end up with them willing to accept a one to one trade. Okay. Uh -huh. So like which path the market followed to get to that new state determines which trade offs they're willing to take in that new state. And, and how does that, can, can, can you tell us like why, like what's an example of one path where they traded one to one and one path where they traded two to one? I can't give you a numerical example off the top of my head because it's messy as all hell. Okay. But the, the basic reason this happens is that it matters how the wealth is distributed within the market. So, like, if a bunch of trades happen, which leaves someone who really likes Apple stock with a lot more of the internal wealth, mm. like, they, they end up with more aggregate shares, uh, then you're going to end up with prices more heavily favoring Apple. Whereas if it's trading along a path that leaves someone who likes Google a lot with a lot more wealth... Hmm. then you're going to end up more heavily favoring Google. Okay, so that makes sense. All right, so we've mentioned that um, in biology, we have these E. coli cells that are somehow, like, pursuing goals and, like, making inferences or something like that. Mm -hmm. But the dynamic models of them seem very simple, and it's not clear how that's, what's going on there. Yep. And we've got financial markets that, like, you might think would have to be coherent ex expected utility maximizers because of math. Yep. But they're not, but they're still, like... You're still getting a lot of stuff out of them that you wanted to get out of respect to utility maximizers. And you think there's something we don't understand there. Yeah. So, like, in both of these, you have people bringing in these intuitions and talking about the systems as, like, having goals or modeling the world or whatever. Like, people talk about markets this way. People talk about organisms this way. Hmm. People talk about neural networks this way. And they sure do intuitively seem to be doing something agenty, right? Okay. Like these, these seem like really good intuitive models for what's going on, but we don't know the right way to translate those like the the low level dynamics of the system into something that actually like captures the semantics of agency. All okay. right. Is that like roughly what you're interested in? Basically, as a researcher. Yeah. Okay, so cool. like, what I want to do is be able to look at all these different kinds of systems and be like, uh, the, intuitively, it looks like it's modeling the world like. 
How do I back out something that is semantically its world model? Okay, cool. And why is that important? Uh, well, I'll, I'll start with the biology, and then we can like move via analogy back to AI. Uh, okay. So like in biology, for instance, the, the problem is an E. coli has... Uh, what, 15, 20,000 genes, a human has 30,000. It's just this very large dynamical system, which, like, you can run it on a computer just fine, but you can't really get a sort of human understanding of what's going on in there just by looking at the low-level dynamics of the system. On the other hand, it sure does seem like humans are able to get an intuitive understanding of what's going on in E. coli, mm. and they do that by thinking of them as agents. This is how most biologists are thinking about them, how most biologists are driving their intuition about like how the system works, right? Okay. So to carry that over to AI, you've got the same thing with neural networks. There are these huge, completely opaque systems, sort of giant tensors, they're too big for a human to just like look at all the numbers and the dynamics and understand intuitively what's going on. But we, we already have these intuitions that like these systems have goals, these systems are trying to do things, uh, or at least we're trying to make systems which have goals and try to do things. Mm. And it seems like we should be able to turn that intuition into math, right? Like the intuition is coming from somewhere. It didn't come from just like magic out of the sky. Like if it's understandable intuitively, it's going to be understandable mathematically. Okay. And so I guess there are a few questions I have about this. So one is like one thing you could try to do is you could try and really understand ideal agency mm -hmm. or like optimal agency. Like what would, what would be like the best way for an agent to be? Mm -hmm. And... I think the reason people like to do that is they're like, well, you know, we're going to try and build agents well. Uh, we're going to try and have agents that figure out how to be the best agents they can be. So let's just figure out, like, you know, what the best possible thing is in this domain. Whereas I see you was more saying, like, okay, let's just understand the, like, agenty stuff we have mm -hmm. around us, like E. coli. But I think, like, an intuition you might have is, like, well, <laughs> yeah, optimal, like, super powerful AI that we care about uh, understanding Maybe that's going to be more like ideal AI than it's going to be like E. coli. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm wondering Yeah, what, what your take is on that. So first of all, from my perspective, the main reason you want to understand ideal agents is because it's a limiting case which you expect real agents to approach, right? Okay. Like you would expect humans to be closer to an ideal agent than an E. coli, and for you expect both of these to be much closer to an ideal agent than like a rock. And so it's just like in other areas of math, like we, we understand the general phenomenon by thinking about the limiting case, which everything else is sort of approximating. Uh -huh. Now, from that perspective, there's the question of how do we like intuitively or like how do, how do we get bits of information about what that ideal case is going to look like before we've worked out the math? It's so like in general, it's hard to find ideal mathematical concepts and principles. Like, your brain sort of has to get the concepts from somewhere and get them all loaded into your head before you can actually figure out what the math is supposed to look like, right? Hmm. We don't go figuring these things out just by doing brute force search on theorem space. We go and figure these things out by having some intuition for how the thing is supposed to work and then sort of, like, backing out what the math looks like from that. And if you want to know, like what ideal agency is going to look like, and you want to get bits of information about that, the way you're going to do that is go look at real agents, right? And that also means if you go look at real agents and see that they don't match your current math for ideal agents, that's a pretty strong hint that something is wrong with that math. So like the markets example I talked about earlier, we had these coherence theorems that were talking about ideal agents they should end up being expected utility maximizers. And then we go look at markets and we're like, well, these aren't expected utility maximizers, and yet we cannot money pump them. What's going on here, right? Yeah, yeah. Then what we should do based on that is like backpropagate, be like, okay, why, why did this break our theorems? And then go update the theorems. So like it updates our understanding of what, our, of what the right notion of ideal agency is. Okay, that makes sense. I guess the second question I have is, why think of this as a question of, agency exactly so mm -hmm. so we're in this field called artificial intelligence mm -hmm. or i am i don't know if you consider yourself to be but uh you know you might think that oh the question is we're really interested in smart things what's up with mm -hmm. smartness or intelligence yep um or you might think like oh i want to understand microeconomics or something yep uh like how how do i get a thing that like achieves its goal in the real world by like making trades with other intelligent agents or something mm -hmm. um so so yeah, why pick out agency 
as the concept to really understand. So I wouldn't say that agency is the concept to understand so much as like it's the name for that whole cluster. Okay. Like if you're if you're Isaac Newton in 1665 or 66 or whenever it was, like trying to figure out basic physics, right? Hmm. You've got concepts like force and mass and uh, velocity and position and acceleration and all these things. Like there's a bunch of different concepts and you sort of have to figure them all out at once and see the relationship between them in order to know that you've actually got the right concept, right? Like F equals MA. Hmm. That's when you know you've nailed down the right concepts here because you have this nice relationship between them. Right. Mm. So there's these different concepts like intelligence, agency, optimization, world models, where we kind of need to figure these things out more or less simultaneously and see the relationships between them, confirm that those relationships work the way we intuitively expect them to in order to know that we've gotten the models right. Okay. Uh-huh. Makes sense? I think that makes sense. And thinking about how you think about agency, I get the sense that you're interested in selection theorems. Yeah, that was a bad name. I really need better marketing for that. Okay. Anyway, go on. Well, uh, why are they important, and maybe what's what's the right name for them? Okay, so the concept here is when you have some, some system that's selected to do something interesting. So, mm. like, in evolution, you have, like, natural selection, selecting organisms to reproduce themselves. Or in AI, we're using stochastic gradient descent to select a system which optimizes some objective function on some data. Hmm. It seems intuitively like there should be some general principles that apply to systems which pop out of like selection pressure, right? Uh, so for instance, uh, the coherence theorems are an example of something that's trying to express these sorts of general principles. Like they're saying, hmm. if you are Pareto optimal in some sense, then you should have a utility function, right? And that's the sort of thing where if you have something under selection pressure, you would expect that selection pressure to select for using resources efficiently, for instance, Hmm. and therefore things are going to pop out with utility functions, or at least that's the implicit claim here, right? Uh And the thing I chose the poor name of selection theorems for was this, like, more general strategy of trying to figure out properties of systems which pop out of selection like this, so more general properties. For instance, in biology, we see very consistently that biological organisms are extremely modular. Okay. Uh, some of your work has found something similar in neural networks. It, it seems like a pretty consistent pattern that modularity pops out of systems under selection pressure. So then the question is like, when and why does that happen? Right? That's a general property of systems that are under selection pressure, and we want to understand that property, when and why does it happen? Okay. And thinking of modularity specifically, like how how satisfied are you with our understanding of that? Like, like, do you think we have any guesses, or are they good? Uh, so, first of all, I don't think we even have the right language yet to talk about modularity. Hmm. Like, for instance, in when when people look at modularity in neural networks, they're usually just using these like graph modularity measures, yeah. which are sort of like. They're like or when I do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean yeah. everybody I else other, does the same thing. Yeah, <laughs> like it's it's sort of like a, a hacky notion that you know it's it's enough to if you if you see this this hacky measure telling you that it's very modular, then you're like, yeah, all right, that's pretty modular. But it doesn't really feel like it's the right way to talk about modularity. Like what we want mm. to talk about is something about like information flowing between subsystems. Right? Yep, which. We don't have a nice way to quantify that. And then the second yeah. step on top of that is once you do have the right language in which to talk about it, you want to also, like, you'd expect to find theorems saying things that, like, like uh, uh, if you have this sort of selection pressure, then you should see this sort of modularity pop out. Right? Mm-hmm. And I guess, like, a, an obvious concern is, like, if we don't have the right language for modularity, then presumably there's no theorem in which that language appears. And so uh, you're not talking about the, the true modularity? It's not necessarily that there'd be no theorem. Uh, you you might expect to find, like, some really hacky, messy theorems, hmm. but, like, it's generally not going to be real robust. Like, you're, if, if it's the wrong concept of modularity, there, there's going to be systems that are modular but, like, don't satisfy this definition, or systems which do satisfy this definition but are, like, not actually that modular in some important way, hmm. right? 
and it's going to be sort of at cross purposes to the thing that the selection pressure is actually selecting for. So you're going to get relatively weak conditions in the theorem, or like, or sorry, you'll need overly restrictive preconditions for the in the theorem, and you'll get not very good post conditions, right? Okay, cool. So the theorem is going to assume a lot, but not produce a lot. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, speaking of modularity, um, I understand like you. A lot of your work is interested in this idea of abstraction. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure if like you think of abstraction as closely related to modularity or analogical or just like another thing out there. They are distinct phenomena, the way I think about them. Like abstraction is mostly about the structure of the world, whereas modularity in the like the kinds of modularity I'm talking about in the context of selection theorems is mostly about the internal structure of uh, of these systems under selection pressure. Okay. That said. They do boil down to like very analogous concepts. Like yeah. It's very much about interacting more with some chunk of stuff and not very much with the stuff elsewhere, right? Yeah, and and it seems like you might you might also have for some kind of connection where like like if the real world supports some kind of good abstractions, mm -hmm. you might hope that I organize my cognition in a sort of modular way. <laughs> Yeah. Where like yeah. Uh, yeah, I've got one module per abstraction or something right. like that. So this is this is exactly why it's important that they're distinct concepts, because uh, you want to have a non-trivial claim mm. that like the internal organization of the system is going to be selected to reflect the external uh, natural abstractions in the environment. Cool. So before we get into what's going on with abstraction, first I'd like to ask. Why should we care about abstraction? And like, how does it relate to the task of understanding agency? So there's a general challenge here, which is in, in like communicating why it's important, which is you kind of have to go a few layers down the game tree before you run into it. All right. uh, so like if you're a biologist starting out trying to understand how E. coli are agents, or if you're an AI person just working on interpretability of neural nets, or if you're uh, at MIRI trying to figure out principles of decision theory or embedded agents or whatever, it's not immediately obvious that abstraction is going to be your big bottleneck, right? You start to see it when you're like trying to formulate what an agent even is. Hmm. And there's like the Cartesian boundary is the key thing here, like the boundary between the inside of the agent and the outside of the agent. Like you're saying this part of the world is the agent. The rest of the world is not the agent, it's the environment. But that's like a very artificial thing, right? There's no sort of physically fundamental barrier that's the Cartesian boundary in, in the physical world, right? Sure. So then the question is like, where, where does that boundary come from? Like it sure conceptually seems to be a good model. And that's, that's where abstraction comes in. Like an agent is an abstraction and that Cartesian boundary is essentially an abstraction boundary. It's like the the conceptual boundary through which this abstraction is interacting with the rest of the world. Okay. So that's like a sort of first reason you might run into it if you're thinking specifically about agency. Actually, so going there, if an agent is an abstraction, uh -huh. it doesn't seem like it has to follow that we need to care a lot about abstractions just because like, like the word agent is a word, uh -huh. but we don't have to worry too much about like the philosophy of language to understand agents just because of that, right? Potentially, yes. So there's certainly like concepts where we don't have to understand the general nature of concepts or of abstraction in order to formalize the concept. Yeah. Like in physics, we have force and mass and density and pressure and stuff, right? Like those, yep. those we can operationalize very cleanly without having to get into how abstraction works. On the other end of the spectrum, there's things where we're probably not going to be able to get like clean formulations of the concept without understanding abstraction in general, like water bottle okay. or sunglasses. For those not aware, uh, John has a water bottle and sunglasses near him and is waving them <laughs> yes. kindly. And so you could imagine that agent is in that agency is in the former category, where mm. like there are nice operationalizations we could find without having to understand abstraction in general. Yeah. Practically speaking, we do not seem to be finding them very quickly. And I certainly expect that routing through at least some understanding of abstraction first will get us there much faster. In part, I expect this because I've now spent a while understanding abstraction better, and I'm already seeing the returns on understanding agency better. Okay, cool. One thing that seems kind of strange there, I don't know, maybe it's not strange, but naively it seems strange that like 
there, there's some spectrum mm -hmm. from like things where you can easily understand the abstraction like mm -hmm. pressure to things where like abstraction fits, but just like close to our border of understanding what an abstraction is. And then there's the zone of things which are just like not actually good abstractions, uh, which unfortunately I can't describe because if there were things for which there are good words, <laughs> tend to be useful abstractions. But like, well, there are words that are under social pressure to be bad abstractions. Uh, if we want to get into politics, yeah. Well, I don't. Um, <laughs> I, don't know, I, I guess in the study of like, uh, sometimes in philosophy, people talk about the composite object that's like this particular random bit of Jupiter and this particular random bit of Mars and this right. particular random bit of your hat. Not a good abstraction. Yep. So there's this whole range of like how well things fit into abstraction. Yep. And like it seems like agency is in this like border zone. Mm -hmm. uh, what's what's up with that? Isn't that like a weird coincidence? Uh, I don't think it's actually in a border zone. I think it's just like squarely on the clean side of things. Okay. We just haven't yet figured out the language and like doing it the old fashioned way is really slow. One of my go-to examples here is Shannon inventing information theory, right? All like right. He found these, these really nice formalizations of some particular concepts we had, and he spent like 10 years figuring these things out and was like this incredible genius. Uh, we want to go faster than that. Like this, the, he, that guy was like a once in 50 years, maybe once in 100 years genius, and hmm. like figured out four or five important concepts. Okay. Like we 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 want to be we want to get an iterative loop going and not be like sort of trundling along at this very slow pace of theorizing. All right. Do you think there's just like a large zone of things that are square, squarely within the actual concept of abstraction, but mm -hmm. like are under standing of abstraction is something like a low dimensional manifold, like like a line on a piece of paper where the line takes up way less area than the paper? I'm not sure what you're trying to gesture at. Uh. So so do you think that that it's just something like there are tons of concepts yep. that are solidly abstractions, mm -hmm. but we don't have solid language to understand why they're abstractions. Correct. So it's not surprising that agency is one of those. Yes. I should distinguish here between like, there's things which are mathematical abstractions, like agency or information, and there's things that are physical abstractions, like water bottle or sunglasses. The mathematical ones are somewhat easier to get at because in some sense, all you really need is the theory of abstraction to like and then the rest is just math. Yeah, yeah. The physical ones, potentially, you still need a bunch of data and a bunch of like priors about our particular world or whatever. All right. So that was one way we could have um, got to the question of abstraction. You said there was something to do with biology as oh, well? Oh, there's absolutely other paths to this. So right. like, this was roughly the path that I originally came in through. You could also come in through something like, if we want to talk about human values and have like robust formulations of human values. The things that humans care about themselves tend to be abstractions. Like I care about, uh, I care about pan my pants and uh, windows and trees and stuff. I don't care so much about quantum field fluctuations. Quantum field fluctuations, lots of them, most of them are not very interesting. So like the things humans care about are abstractions. So if you're thinking about like value learning, like learning human values, having a good formulation of what abstractions are is going to massively, exponentially narrow down the space of uh, things you might be looking for. Like, you know we care about these particular high-level abstractions. You no longer have to worry about, like, all possible value functions over quantum fields, right? Sure. You're, you're, you can worry about macroscopic things. Similarly, for things like uh, talking about impact, the sort of impact we care about is like things affecting sort of big macroscopic stuff. We don't care about things affecting uh, rattlings of molecules in the air, right? Uh -huh. So again there, it's all about the, the high level abstractions are the things we care about, so we want to measure impact in terms of those. And if you have a good notion of abstraction, a robust notion of abstraction, then you can have a robust notion of impact in terms of that. Okay, cool. And so what would it look like to understand enough about abstraction that we could satisfy multiple of these like divergent ways to start caring about abstraction. Yeah, so one one way to think of it is you want a mathematical model of abstraction which very robustly matches the 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 things we think of as abstraction. So for instance, it should be able to look at Shannon's theory of information and like these measures of mutual information and channel capacity and say, ah, yes, these are uh, very natural abstractions in mathematics. It should also be able to look at uh, a water bottle and be like, 
uh, ah, yes, in this universe, the water bottle is a very natural abstraction. And this should like robustly extend to all the different things we think of ab abstractions. It should also capture the intuitive properties we expect out of abstractions. So like if I'm thinking about water bottles, I expect that I should be able to think of it as a fairly high level object, maybe made out of a few parts, but like I don't have to think about all the low level goings on of the material the water bottle is made of in order to like think about the water bottle, right? Mm. I can pick it up and move it around. Nice thing about the water bottle is it's a solid object, so there's like six uh, parameters I need to summarize the position of the water bottle, even yeah. though it has like a mole of particles in there, right? Yeah. Well, I guess you, you also need to know whether the lid is open or closed. Yep. So it's a key. Th water that, that would add another what, what, like six dimensions or so, probably less than six because it's attached there. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that'll add a few more dimensions. But like we're talking single, maybe low double digits numbers of dimensions to summarize the water bottle in this sense. Yeah, way fewer than the We're not talking a mole. Definitely six, not a yeah. mole. Okay, cool. So basically something like uh, we want to understand abstraction well enough to know, like just take anything and be like, okay, what are the good abstractions here? Yes. And like know that we know that. And this should like robustly match our, our intuitive concept of what abstractions are. So when we go use those intuitions in order to like design something, it will robustly end up working the way we expect it to insofar as like we're, we're, we're using these mathematical principles to guide it. Okay. At this point, I'd like to talk about your work on abstraction, which I, I, know, I think of it under the heading is the natural abstraction hypothesis. So first of all, can you tell us what is the natural abstraction hypothesis? So there's a few parts to it. The first part is the idea that our physical world has some broad class of abstractions which are natural in the sense that like a lot of different different minds, a lot of different kinds of agents under selection pressure in this world will converge to similar abstractions, or roughly the same abstractions. Okay. Uh, so that's the first part. The second part, obvious next guess based on that, is that these are basically the abstractions which humans use for the most part. And then the the third part, which is where like the actual math I do comes into it, is that these abstractions mostly come from information which is relevant at a distance. Okay. So like there is relatively little information about any little chunk of the universe which propagates to chunks of the universe far away. All right. And what's like the status of the natural abstraction hypothesis? Is it a natural abstraction theorem yet? Or like how much of it have you knocked off? So I do have some pretty decent theorems at this point within worlds that are that are similar to ours in the sense that they have local dynamics. Mm. Uh, so like in our world, there's a light speed limit. You can only mm. directly interact with things like nearby in space time. Anything else has to be indirect interactions that like propagate, right? In universes like that, I have this cool result called the telephone theorem, which basically says that the only information which will be relevant over a long distance is information that is arbitrarily perfectly conserved as it propagates far away. Okay. So that means that most information, presumably is not arbitrarily perfectly conserved, all of that information will be lost, it gets wiped out by noise. Okay. I guess one question is, um, so part of the hypothesis was that a lot of agents would be using these natural abstractions. Mm -hmm. What counts as a lot, and what class of like uh, agents are you imagining? Good question. So first of all, this is like, not a question which the math is explicitly addressing yet. This okay. is intended to be addressed later. Like, I'm mostly not explicitly talking about agents yet. Okay. That said, very recently I've, I've started thinking about agents as things which optimize stuff at a distance. Hmm. So in the same way that abstraction is talking about information relevant at a distance, we can talk about agents which are optimizing things far away. And presumably most of the the like agenty things that are interesting to us are going to be interesting because they're optimizing over a distance. If something is only optimizing like a tiny little chunk of the world in a one centimeter cube around it, we mostly don't care that much about that. Like we care insofar as it's Im affecting things that are far away. So in that case, this thing about like only so much information propagates over a distance, well, obviously that's going to end up being the information that you end up caring about influencing for optimization purposes, and indeed the math 
bears that out. Okay. Uh, it's you end up if you're trying to optimize things far away, then it's the abstractions that you care about because like that's the only channel you have to interact with things far away. Sure. What's the relevant notion of far away that we're using here? So uh, we're modeling the world as a big causal graph, and then we're talking about nested layers of Markov blankets in that causal graph. Uh, so physically, you could in, in our particular universe, our our causal graph follows the structure of space-time. Things hmm. only interact with things that are nearby in this sort of little four-dimensional sphere of space-time around the first thing. Okay. So you can imagine like little four-dimensional spheres of space-time, like nested one within the other. So you've got like a sequence of nested spheres. And this would be a, a sequence of Markov blankets that as you go outwards through these spheres, you get further and further away. And that's that's the notion of distance here. Now it doesn't necessarily have to be like spherical. Like you could take any surface you want. They don't even have to be like surfaces in our like four-dimensional space-time. They could be uh, more abstract things than that. The important thing is that like each of these blankets is the the things inside the blanket only interact with the things outside the blanket via the blanket itself. Like it has to go okay. through the blanket. So it sounds like the way this is going to work is that you're um, you, you can get a notion of something like locality out of this, mm -hmm. but it seems like it's going to be difficult to get a notion of like. Is it three units of distance away, or is it ten units of distance away? Because like your yeah. concentric spheres can be like closely packed or loosely Correct. packed, right? Yeah. So uh, in general, like the first of all, the theorem doesn't explicitly talk about distance per se. It's just talking about limits as you get far away. Okay. Uh, I do have other theorems now that like don't require those those nested sequences of Markov blankets at all. Uh, but like, there's yeah, it's it's not really about the, the distance itself. It's about like defining what far away means. Okay, sure. That makes sense. And I guess one thing which occurs to me is I would think that sometimes systems could like have different types of information going in different directions, right? Yep. So you might Absolutely. imagine, I don't know, a house with uh, two directional antennas and like mm -hmm. in one it's beaming out the Simpsons and the other it's beaming out like, uh, I don't know, the heart rate of everyone in the house or something. Yep. And then you'll also have a bunch of other directions which aren't beaming out anything. Yeah, yeah. So what's up with that? Naively, it doesn't seem like it's handled well by your theorem. So if you're thinking of it in terms of these nested sequences of Markov blankets, you could like draw these blankets going along one direction or along a different direction or along another direction, right? Mm. Uh, and depending on which direction you draw them along, you may get different abstractions corresponding to information which is conserved or lost along that direction, basically. There's the the versions of this which don't explicitly talk about the Markov blankets. Instead, you just talk about everything that's propagating in, in every direction, mm. and then you'll just end up with like some patch of the world that has a bunch of information shared with this one. And if there's like a, a big patch of the world, that means it must have propagated to a fairly large amount of the world, right? All right. So, so sorry, in that one, is it just saying like, yeah, here's a region of the world that's like somehow linked with uh, my house. Yeah, so like if, this we take, will be if we take the example of the directional antenna beaming the Simpsons from your house, hmm. uh, there's going to be like some chunk of chunk of air going in like a sort of line or cone or something away from your house, yep. which has a very strong signal yep. uh, of the Simpsons playing. And that's all, all that, that whole region of space time is going to have a bunch of mutual information that's like the Simpsons episode, right? Okay. And then the stuff elsewhere is not going to contain all that information. So there's this natural abstraction, which is sort of like localized to this particular cone mm. in the same way that, for instance, if I have a physical gear in a gearbox, there's going to be a bunch of information about the rotation speed of that gear, mm. which is sort of localized to the gear. Yeah, but it, like it won't be localized to somebody who's standing outside the box. Exactly. Okay. So... Can you just spell it out for us again? Like, why does the natural abstraction hypothesis matter? So if you have these natural abstractions that lots of different kinds of agents are going to converge to, then first that gives you, it gives you a lot of hope for some sort of interpretability or some sort of like being able to communicate with or understand what other kinds of agents are doing. Uh, so for instance, if the natural abstraction hypothesis holds, then we'd expect to be able to look inside of neural networks and find representations of these natural abstractions, right? If we're good enough at looking. 
if we're if yeah if we if, like have the math and we're, we're we know how to use it right yeah like it should be possible another example there there's this puzzle babies are able to figure out what words mean with like one or two examples right mm. like you show a baby an apple you say apple very quickly it's got this apple thing down however if you think about like how many possible apple classifier functions there are on a one megabyte image yeah how many such functions are there it's going to be like two to the two to a million sure you in order to learn that apple classifier by brute force you would need about two to a million bits two to a million samples of does this contain an apple or not babies do it with one or two Mm. so like clearly the place we're getting our concepts from is not just like brute force classification like we have to have some sort of prior notion of what sorts of things are concept e what sorts of things we normally attach words to otherwise we wouldn't have language at all it, it just big o algorithmically would not work and the question is like all right what's going on there how how is the baby doing this yeah and natural abstractions would provide like an obvious natural answer for that yeah i guess like it seems like this is almost like so in statistical learning theory, sometimes people try to um, prove generalization bounds yep. on learning algorithms by saying, well, there's only a small number of things this algorithm could have learned, and the true thing is one of them. So if it gets the thing right on the training data set, then like, there's only so many different ways it could wiggle on the test data set, and because yep. there's a small number of them, then it's probably going to get the right one on the test data set. Right. And there's this famous problem, which is like neural networks can express a whole bunch of stuff, mm -hmm. but like... Yeah, it seems like one way I could think of the natural abstraction hypothesis is saying, well, like, they'll just tend to learn the natural abstractions, which is the smaller hypothesis class, and, yep. like, that's why uh, statistical learning theory can work at all. Yeah, so this is tying back to the selection theorems thing. One thing I expect is a property that you'll see in selected systems is you'll get either some combination of broad peaks in the parameter space or robust circuits or robust strategies. So like strategies which work even if you change the data a little bit. Some combination of these two, I expect, selects heavily for natural abstractions. Yeah. Like you can have optimal strategies which just like encrypt everything on the way in, decrypt everything on the way out, and it's total noise in the middle. So like clearly you don't have to have a lot of structure there just to get an optimal behavior. But when we go look at systems, they like humans sure do seem to converge on all like similar abstractions. Like we have this thing about the babies. Yeah. So it seems like that extra structure has to come from some combination of broadness and robustness rather than just optimality alone. Yeah. So there are actually two things this reminds me of that I hope you'll indulge me and uh, right. maybe comment on. So the first thing is um, there's this finding that neural networks are really good at classifying images. Mm -hmm. But you can also train them to optimality on, like, just make images by selecting random values for every pixel and, like, giving them classes. Yep. And, like, neural networks will, in fact, be able to memorize that data set. Yep. Uh, but it takes them a bit longer yep. than it takes them to learn, like, actual data sets of real images, which seems like it could be related to somehow it's harder for them to find the unnatural abstractions. Yep. Uh, the second thing is I have a colleague... Well, a colleague in the broad sense, he's a professor at the University of Oxford called Jakob Furster, who's interested in coordination, mm -hmm. particularly zero-shot coordination. So imagine, like, I train my AI bot, you train your AI bot. He's interested in, like, okay, what's, like, a good rough algorithm we could use where, like, even if we had slightly different implementations and slightly different, you know, batch sizes and learning rates yep. and stuff, our bots would still get to play nicely together. And... A lot of what he's worried about is ruling out like these strategies that, um, like, if, if I just trained a bunch of bots that learn to play with themselves, then they would learn these like really weird-looking arbitrary encoding mechanisms. Yep. Um, like if I if I jiggle my arm slightly, like this the way, honey bees this means... do a little dance that tells the other bees where to fly. He actually uses exactly that example. Nice. Uh, or he did in the one talk I attended. Um, and he's like, no, we've got to figure out how to make it not do that kind of crazy stuff. So, yeah, I'm wondering if you've thought about the relationship between natural abstraction hypothesis and, like, coordination rather than just, like, a single agent. Yeah, so I've mostly thought about that in the concept of, like, how how are humans able to have language that works at all? Like, yeah, yeah. example, But it's the same principles. Sure. Like, you've got this giant space, and you need to somehow coordinate on something in there. Like, there has to be some sort of prior notion of what, like, the right things are. Cool. One question I have... A thing that seems problematic for the natural hypothesis, abstraction hypothesis mm -hmm. 
is that sometimes people use the wrong abstractions and yep, then definitely. change their minds, right? So, like, I guess a classic example of this is, like, is a whale a fish? Mm -hmm. um, in some biblical texts, uh, whales are described as fish or yep. things that seem like they probably are whales. But, like, now we kind of think that that's, like, the wrong way to define what a fish is, or at least yep. some people think that. Yeah. Uh, so a few notes on this. First, it is totally compatible with the hypothesis that at least some human concepts some of the time would not match the natural boundaries. That's like, it, okay. we're, it doesn't have to be a 100% of the time thing. Like, it is entirely possible that people just, like, missed somehow. Okay. That said, whale being a fish would not be an example of that. The telltale sign of that would be, like, people are using the same word and, like, Whenever they try to talk to each other, they just get really confused because nobody's nobody like quite has the same concept there, right? That would be a sign that humans just like are using a word that doesn't have a corresponding natural abstraction. Okay. Next thing, there's the general philosoph philosophical idea that words point to clusters in thing space, uh, okay. and that still carries over to natural abstractions. Can, like, can you say what a, what a cluster in thing space is? Uh, sure. So the idea here is. You've got, like, a bunch of objects that are sort of, like, similar to each other. So, like, we cluster them together. We treat these as, like, instances of the cluster. But you're still going to have lots of stuff out on the boundaries. Okay. It's not like you can come along and draw a nice, clean dividing line between, like, what is a fish and what is not a fish. There's going to be stuff out on the boundaries, and that's fine. We can still have well-defined words in the same sense mathematically that we can have well-defined clusters. So, like, you can talk about the average fish or like the sort of shape of the fish cluster, like what are the major dimensions along which fish vary and like how much do they vary along those dimensions. And you can have unambiguous, well-defined answers to questions like what are the main dimensions along which fish vary without necessarily having to have hard dividing lines between like what is a fish and what is not a fish. All right. So in the case of whales, do you think that what happened is like humans somehow miss the natural abstraction or do you think they like the version of fish that includes like are you saying the whale is like a boundary thing that's like yes. okay. so a whale like clearly it, it shares a lot of properties with fish you can learn a lot of things about whales by looking at fish right okay. like it is it is clearly at least somewhat in that cluster mm. like it's it's not a central member of that cluster but it's definitely at least on the boundary yeah and it is also in the mammal cluster like it's it's at least on that boundary so like yeah, it, it's it's a case like that. So if that were true, I feel like so biologists understand a lot mm -hmm. about whales. I'm told, mm -hmm. I assume, and uh, I hope I'm not just totally wrong about this. But my understanding is that biologists are not like is that biologists are not unsure about whether whales are fish. No, they're not, not like oh, they're like almost they're basically fish. Or I, so like once you get down, once you start being able to read genetic code, the phylogeny like the branching of the, the evolutionary tree becomes, like, the natural way to classify things, and it just makes way more sense to classify that things for lots of purposes than any other way. And, right. like, if you're trying to think about, say, the shape of whale bodies, then it is still going to be more useful to think of it as a fish than a mammal, but, like, mostly what biologists are interested in is more, of like, uh, metabolic stuff or, like, what's going on in the genome. And for that much broader variety of purposes, it's going to be much more useful to think of it as a as a mammal. Okay. So if I, if I tie this back into like how abstractions work, mm -hmm. are you saying something like like the abstraction of fish is this kind of thing where whale was an edge case, but like once you gain like more information, it starts uh, fitting more naturally into the mammal. So I mean, the right answer here is like. Things that do not always unambiguously belong to one category and not another. Okay. And also the categories, like, the natural versions of these categories are not actually mutually exclusive. When you're thinking about phylogenetic trees, it is useful to think of them as mutually exclusive. But, like, the underlying concepts are not. All right. Cool. Yeah, I guess digging in a little bit, when you say abstraction is, like, information that's preserved over a distance, like, mm -hmm. should I think of the underlying thing as, like, there's probabilistic things and there's some probabilistic dependence and there's a lot mm -hmm. of probabilistic independence or yep. it's like so it, it, is it just like based on probabilistic stuff yep so the current formulation is all about like probabilistic conditional independence right like you have some information propagating uh conditional on that information everything else is independent that said 
there are known problems with this. For instance, this is really bad for handling mathematical abstractions like what is a group or what is, what is a field, right? These, yeah, yeah. These are clearly very natural abstractions, and this framework does not handle that at all. And I, I expect that this framework captures sort of like the fundamental concepts in such a way that like it will clearly generalize once we have the, the language for talking about like more mathies type things. But like it's it's clearly not the whole answer yet. When you say once we have the language for talking about more mathy type things, what what do you mean there? Probably category theory, but like nobody seems to right. speak that language particularly well. So so if we understood like the the true nature of maths, then we could understand like how it's yes. related to the like probably if stuff. you had a sufficiently deep understanding of category theory and could take like the probabilistic formulation of abstraction that I have and express it in category theory, then it would mm -hmm. clearly generalize to all this other stuff in nice ways. But I'm not sure any person currently alive understands category theory well enough for that to work. How well would they, like, some people write textbooks about category theory, right? Yeah, Is that not well enough? Almost all of them are trash. Well, some of them aren't, apparently. I mean, the, the best category theory textbooks I have seen are solidly, like, decent. But, like, they're still... I, I don't think I have found anyone who like has a really good intuition for like category theoretic concepts. Uh -huh. There are lots of people who can like crank the algebra and like they can like use the algebra to say some things in some narrow context, but I don't really know anyone who can go like, I don't know, look at a giraffe and mm. talk about the giraffe directly in category theoretic terms and say things which are non-trivial and actually useful. Okay. Like mostly they can say very simple, stupid things, which is a sign that you haven't really deeply understood the language yet. Okay. So there's this question of how does it apply to math. I also have this question of how it applies to physics. So some, well, I believe that physics is actually deterministic, uh, okay. which you might believe if you were into many worlds quantum mechanics. Or at least it can, seems conceivable that physics could have been deterministic. Yep. And yet, you know, maybe we'd, we would still have stuff that looks kind of like this. Yeah. So in the physics case, it's we're, we're kind of on easy mode because chaos is a thing. Okay. So, for instance, a, a classic example here is a billiard system. So, like, you've got a bunch of little hard balls bouncing around on a table yep. inelastically. Sorry, perfectly elastically, so, like, their energy isn't lost. Uh, and the thing is, every time there's a collision, and then the balls roll for a while, and there's another collision, uh, it basically doubles the the noise in the angle of a ball, roughly speaking. Uh, so, like, the, the noise grows exponentially over time, and you very quickly become maximally uncertain about the positions of all the balls. When, when you say someone's uncertain about the positions of all the balls, mm -hmm. like, why... So, meaning, if you have any, any uncertainty at all in their initial conditions... Yep that very quickly gets amplified into being completely uncertain about where they ended up. But why would no idea. Why why would anything within this universe have uncertainty about their initial conditions given that it's a deterministic world and everything is like you can infer everything from every, from everything else? Well, you can't infer everything from anything everything else. I mean, why go look I? at a billiards go look at a billiards table and like try to measure the balls and see how precise you can get their positions and velocities. Yeah, what's going on there? Like why like your measurement tools in fact have limited precision, and therefore you will not have arbitrarily precise knowledge of those those states. So in a when you say my measurement tools have limited precision, mm -hmm. in a deterministic world, yeah. it's not because there's like random noise that's washing out the signal or mm -hmm. anything. So yeah, what, what do you mean my measurement tools have? I mean, yeah, take a ruler. <laughs> look, at, look at the lines on the ruler. They're only so far apart. Okay. And like, your eyes, like if you if you use your eye, you can get like another tenth of a millimeter out of that ruler. But it's still, you can only you can only measure so so small, right? So so if the claim something like there's chaos in the billiard balls, where mm -hmm. like you know if you change the initial conditions of the billiard balls very slightly, that makes a big change to where the billiard balls are. Yep. But, Later on. But like I as a physical system, like maybe there are a whole bunch of different initial states of mm -hmm. the billiard bolts that get mapped to the same mental state of me. Yep. And that's why uncertainty is kicking in? Yep. You clearly, like, you will not be able to tell from your personal measurement tools, like your eyes and your rulers, 
whether the ball is right here or whether the ball is uh, a nanometer to the side of right here. Okay. And then once those balls start rolling around, very quickly it's going to matter whether it was right here or a nanometer to the side. Okay. So And so the story here is something like, like the way probabilities come into the picture at all, mm-hmm. or the way uncertainty comes into the picture at all, is because like things are deterministic, but there's like many to one functions, and you're trying to invert them yep. as a human, and that's why there's things being messed up. So the problem with, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't want to put you into the deep end of philosophy of physics, or too unnecessarily, but like, suppose I believe in like many worlds quantum mechanics, mm-hmm. and the reason you should suppose that is that I do. Um, in many worlds, in many worlds quantum mechanics, but stuff is deterministic. Sorry, but do you a leave it? Uh I think so. Anyway, go on. So in many worlds quantum mechanics, there's no such thing as like many to one functions in terms of physical evolution, right? No. Like the jargon is that the time evolution is a unitary, which means that like two different initial states always turn into two different yep. subsequent states. This is true in chaotic systems. Like there are lots of chaotic systems with this property. Okay, so what's going on with this idea that there's some many-to-one function that I'm trying to invert, that well, that's the, why I'm uncertain? The many-to-one function is the function from the state of the system to your observations. It's not the function from state of system to future state of system. Okay, but like, I'm also part of the physical system of the world, right? Yep, yep. yes you are. So why isn't, why isn't the chaos meaning that I have a really good measurement of the initial state? Like, when you say there's chaos, right, that mm-hmm. means the billiard balls are doing an amazing job of measuring the initial state of the billiard balls, right? In some sense, yep. Why aren't why aren't I doing, doing that, that amazing, amazing job? job? <laughs> well, uh, you could certainly imagine that you just like somehow accidentally start out with a perfect measurement of the billiard ball state, and you know that that would be a coherent world that that could happen. But it gets uh, better. Empirically, and better we time. observe that you do not do that. Okay. Yeah. Well, what's going on? Empirically, we observe that you have uh, only very finite information about these billiard balls, like your the mutual information between you and the billiard balls is pretty small. You could actually, uh, if I want to be... Sorry, what do you mean the mutual information? So in a deterministic world, what do you mean the mutual information is very small? So empirically, you could like make predictions about what's going on with these billiard balls or like guess where they are when they're starting out and then also have someone else take some very precise like nanometer measurements and see how well your uh, guesses about these billiard balls map to those nanometer precision measurements. And then because you're making predictions about them, you can you know, crank the math on a mutual information formula, okay. assuming your predictions are coherent enough to imply probabilities. If they're not even doing that, then you're like in stupid land, All right. and your predictions are just total <laughs> shit. But like, yeah, you can get some mutual information out of that, and then you can quantify uh, how much information does Daniel have about these billiard balls. Okay. Like in the pre-Bayesian days, this was like how people thought about it, right? Like, Yeah, I guess I'm still not... So, okay, I totally believe that that would happen, mm-hmm. right? But but I guess the question is, like, how can that be what's happening in a deterministic world? That I still don't totally get. I mean, what's, what's, what's missing? What's missing is that if... So we have this deterministic world. A whole mm-hmm. bunch of stuff is chaotic, right? Yep. What chaos means is that everything, everything is measuring everything else very, very well. No. It does not mean that everything is measuring everything else very, very well. Okay. What it means is that... Everything is measuring some very particular things very, very well. Uh, So, for instance, well, okay, not for instance. Uh, Conceptually, what happens in chaos is that the current macroscopic state starts to depend on, like, less and less significant bits in the initial state. Yeah. So, like, if you just had a simple one-dimensional system that starts out with this real number state, uh, and you're looking at the first 10 bits in in time step 1, and then you look at the first 10 bits in time step 2. Well, the first 10 bits in time step 2 are going to depend on the first 11 bits in time step 1. Okay. And then in time step 3, it's going to depend on the first 12 bits in time step 1, right? So you're yep. depending on more bits further and further back in that expansion over time, right? Yep. This does not mean that everything is depending on everything else. And in particular, if the if like the bits in time step 100 are depending on the first 100 bits, you still only have 10 bits that are depending. So like there's only so much information about 100 bits that 10 bits can contain, mm. right? Like, you have to be collapsing it down an awful lot somehow, right? And even if it's collapsing according to, like, some random function, mm. random functions have a lot of really simple structure to them. Yeah. So, like, one, one particular way to imagine this is, like, maybe you're just XORing those first 100 bits to get bit 1, right? And if you're just XORing them then that's extremely simple structure in the sense that like flipping any one of them flips the flips the output yeah right?
random random functions end up working sort of like that. If you fl you you only need to flip like a handful of them in order to flip the output uh, for any given setting, right? All right. And now I have forgotten how I got down that tangent. What was the original question? The original question is: In a deterministic world, how does any of this probabilistic inference happen? Mm -hmm. Given that it seems like my physical state sort of has to like there's no randomness where my physical state can only lossily encode the physical state of some system that I'm interested, some there's other subsystem no... of the real universe that I'm interested in. Say that again. So, if if the real world isn't random, mm -hmm. right? Then like every physical system, like there's only one way it could have been, right? For some value of could. So it's not obvious why anybody has to do any probabilistic inference. Right. I mean, like, given the initial conditions, there's only one way the universe could be. But, like, okay. you don't know all the initial conditions. You can't know all the initial conditions because you're embedded in the system. So are you saying something like the initial conditions, like, like there are 50 bits in the initial conditions, and mm -hmm. I'm a simple function of the initial conditions, such that the initial conditions could have been different, but I would have been the same? Uh, let's forget about bits for a minute and talk about, like, Let's say let's say atoms. We'll say we're in a classical world. Okay. Daniel is made of atoms. How many atoms are you made of? Uh, I guess a couple moles, uh, which is probably a bit more than that. I would guess like tens of moles. Okay. So let's say atom. Sorry, Daniel is made of <laughs> Thank you. tens of moles of atoms. Uh, so to describe Daniel's initial like state at some time, we'll take that to be the initial state. Daniel's initial state consists of state of uh, some tens of moles of atoms. Mm. State of the rest of the universe consists of the states of an awful lot of moles of atoms. Okay. I don't actually even know how many orders of magnitude. Sure. But like, unless there's like some extremely simple structure in all the rest of the universe, yep. the states of those uh, tens of moles comprising you are not going to be able to encode both their own states and the states of everything else in the universe. Make sense? That seems right. I do think... Like, isn't there this thing in thermodynamics that the universe had a low entropy initial state? Uh, Doesn't that mean an initial that state that's of. easy to encode? Okay. Well, uh, we can move on from there. Uh, right. I think we spent a bit of time that rabbit hole. The summary is something like abstraction. The way it works is that, like, if I'm far away from some subsystem, mm -hmm. there's, like, only a few bits which are reliably preserved about that subsystem that ever reach me. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, like, everything else is, like, shook out by noise or whatever. And yep. that's what's going on with abstraction. Those few bits, those are, like, the abstractions of the system. Yep. Okay. A thing which you've also talked about as, as like, a different view on abstraction is the generalized copeman pittman darmois theorem. Yep. I hope I'm saying that right. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how it relates? All right. So the... Original koopman pittman darmois theorem was about sufficient statistics. Uh, okay. So basically, you have a bunch of ind uh, IID measurements. Okay. Uh, so, so independent measurements, and each of them like takes the same random yep. distribution. So we're like measuring the same thing over and over again. Yep. And we're supposing that there exists a sufficient statistic, which means that like we can aggregate all of these measurements into some like fixed dimensional thing. No matter how many measurements we take, we can aggregate them all into this one aggregate of like some limited dimension, yep. and that will that will summarize all of the information about these measurements, which is relevant to our estimates of the thing. Right. Uh -huh. uh, so, for instance, if you have normally distributed noise in your measurements, then a sufficient statistic would be the mean and standard deviation of your measurements. Okay. Uh -huh. And you can just like aggregate that over all your measurements, and that's like a two-dimensional. Or n squared plus one over two dimensional if you if you have like n dimensions something like that, uh, but it's like this fixed dimensional summary, right? All right. And you can see how conceptually this is a lot like the abstraction thing. Like I've got this chunk of the world. Like there's this water bottle here. This is a chunk of the world, uh, and I'm summarizing all of the stuff about that water bottle that's relevant to me in like a few relatively small dimensions, right? So conceptually, you might expect these two to be, you know, somewhat closely tied to each other. Yep. The actual claim that koopman pittman darmois makes is that these sufficient statistics only exist for exponential family distributions, uh -huh. uh, also called maximum entropy distributions. 
So this is this really nice class of distributions, which are very convenient to work with. Like most, most of the distributions we work with in statistics or in statistical mechanics are exponential family distributions. And it's this hint that in a world where natural abstractions works, we should be like using exponential family distributions for, for like everything, right? Okay. Uh -huh. Now the the general the, the reason that need to be generalized is because the original Kuhn Pittman Darmois theorem only applies when you have these repeated independent measurements of the same thing, right? Mm. So what I wanted to do was generalize that to, for instance, a big causal graph, right? Like the sort of model that I'm using for, for worlds in my work normally. And that turned out to basically work. Uh, the theorem does, does indeed generalize quite a bit. Uh, there are like some, some terms and conditions there, but yeah, basically okay. works. So the upshot of this is basically we should be using exponential family distributions for abstraction, which makes all sorts of sense. Like if you go look at statistical mechanics, this is exactly what we do. We got like the Boltzmann distribution, for instance. Yep. Uh, it's an exponential family distribution. And in particular, that that's because like um, exponential family distributions are maximum entropy, which means that they're like as uncertain as you can be, subject to some constraints, like uh, you know the average energy. Yes. Now there's there's a key thing there. The interesting question with exponential family distributions, like why do we why do we see them pop up so 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 often? Hmm. Uh, the maximum entropy part makes sense, right? That that part very sensible. The yep. the weird thing is that it's a very specific kind of constraint. The constraints are expected value constraints in particular. Like the expected yep. value of uh, my measurement is equal to something, right? Yeah. Or like, some function of my measurement as well. Yes. But it's always the expected value of whatever the function is of the measurement. Hmm. And then the question is like, why this particular kind of constraint? There, there are lots of other kinds of constraints we could imagine, lots of other kinds of constraints we could dream up. And yet we keep seeing distributions with, that, are, that are max entropic subject to this particular kind of constraint. And then Koopman, Pittman, Darmois is saying, well, these things that are max entropic subject to this particular kind of constraint are like the only things that have these nice summary statistics, the only things that abstract well. Hmm. So not really answering the question, but like it sure is putting a big old spotlight on the question, isn't it? Okay. And so if there's some, yeah, it's almost saying that like somehow like the the summary statistics are the things that are like being transmitted somehow and they're the, yep. thing, the only, the like minimal things which will tell you anything else about the distribution? That's exactly right. Uh, okay. so, so it works out that the, the summary statistics are basically the things which will propagate over a long distance. Okay. Another, another way you can think about the models is you have like the high level concept of this water bottle, you have some summary statistics for the water bottle, and all the low level details of the water bottle are approximately independent given the summary statistics. Okay. The last question I wanted to ask here, yeah, just, just going off the thing you said earlier about abstractions as like being related to what people care about and impact mm -hmm. measures and stuff. So there's this like natural abstraction hypothesis, which says yep. like a wide class of agents will use um, the same kinds of abstractions. Um, also in the world of impact measures, um, a colleague of mine called Alex Turner has worked on attainable utility preservation, yep. which is this idea that like you just look at changes to the world that like a wide variety of agents will care about or yep. something, and that's impact. Yep. That, that will basically change a wide variety of agents' ability to achieve, achieve goals in the world. Yep. I'm wondering, like, yeah, are these just like superficially similar, or is there no, like a these, deep link there? These, these are these are pretty directly related. So if you're thinking about like information propagating far away, uh, anything that's optimizing stuff far away is mainly going to care about that information that's propagating far away. Right? Okay. And if you're in a reasonably large world, most stuff is far away, so like most utility functions are mostly going to be optimizing for stuff far away. Okay. So if you average over a whole bunch of utility functions, it's naturally going to be pulling out those those natural abstractions. Okay. Cool. All right. So I guess yeah, going off our earlier discussion of impact measures, I'd like to talk about value learning and alignment. So uh, and speaking of like people being confused about stuff. How confused do you think we are about alignment? How confused? Uh, what, what, narrow down your question here. What are you asking? Yeah, what, what do you think we don't know about alignment that you wish we did? Look, man, I don't even know which things we don't know. That's how confused we are. Okay. If we knew which specific things we didn't know, we would be in way better shape. All right. Well, okay, here, here's something that someone might think. 
here's the problem of AI alignment. Like, humans have some preferences. Mm -hmm. There's, like, ways the world can be, and we think some of them are better. There are mm -hmm. some of them can worse. Yep. Some of them are worse. And we want AI systems to pick up that ordering and basically, like, try to get worlds that are high in that ordering by okay. doing agency stuff. Problem solved. Uh, what's... I'm sorry, do you think where, there's anything wrong the with that picture? Where the problem was solved? Uh, you know. said what we wanted to do. You didn't say anything at all about how we'd do it. Okay. I mean, even with the want to do part, I'd say there's probably some minor things I disagree with there, but it sounds like a basically okay statement of the problem. All okay. right. So, yeah, I, I guess, well, I don't know. People can just tell you what things they value. and People do just what learn now? That. Man, have you, like... Talk to a human recently. They cannot tell me what things that like. I ask them what they like, and they have no clue. What the, excuse me, they have no clue what they like. I talk to people, and they're like, ah, I'm like, what's your favorite food? And they're like, ah, kale salad. And I'm like, extremely skeptical. All that right. sure sounds like the sort of thing that someone would say if their idea of what food was good was strongly optimized for social signaling, and they were paying no attention whatsoever to the enjoyment of the food in the moment. And people do this all the time. This is this is how the human mind works. People have no idea what they like. I mean, so... Have you had a girlfriend? Did your girlfriend reliably know what she liked? Because my girlfriend certainly does not reliably know what she likes. Well, um, let's... So, okay, if we wanted to understand, like, the, the innermost parts of the human psyche or something, then I, I think this would be a problem. But it seems like... We want to create really smart AI systems to do stuff for us. Mm -hmm. And, like, the stuff doesn't have to be, like... I don't know. Sometimes people are really worried that, that um, even if I wanted to create the best theorem prover in the world mm -hmm. that just, like, uh, you know, could walk around, like, prove some theorems and then, like, solve all of mathematics for me, mm -hmm. um, people act like that's a problem. And, like, I don't know. How hard is it for me to be like, yeah, please solve mathematics. Please don't murder that dog or whatever. Like, is that is that all that hard? I mean... The, the alignment problems for a theorem prover are relatively mild. The problem is you can't do very many interesting things with a theorem prover. Okay, what about, let's say, a material scientist? All right. Here, here's what I want to do. I, like, I want to create an AI system mm -hmm. in a way better than any human. I can just like describe properties of some kind of material that I want. Okay. And the AI system like, you know, figures out like, how I do chemistry to create a material that gets me what I want. Yeah, okay, there so now we're getting there? into, like, at least mildly dangerous land. The big question is, how rare a material are you looking for? Like, if you're asking it a relatively easy problem, then this will probably not be too bad. Okay. If you're asking it for a material that's extremely complicated and, like, very, very, it's very difficult to get a material with these properties, then you're potentially into the into the region where, like, you end up having to engineer biological systems or, like, build nanosystems in order to get the material that you want. Mm. And when your system is spitting out nanomachine designs, then you got to be a little more worried. Okay. So so when, when I was talking about, like, the easy path to alignment, mm -hmm. where you just say what, what outcomes you do and don't want, mm -hmm. why does the easy path to alignment fail here? Oh, God, that, that path fails for so many reasons. All right, so first, there's, there's like... My initial reaction about, like, humans, in fact, have no idea what they want. The things they say they want are not a good proxy for the things they want. Even in the context of material science? In the context of material science? Eh. So, like, the sort of problem you run into there is this, like, unstated parts of the values thing. Like, a human will say, ah, I just want a material with such and such properties. But what they actually want is... Or, like, they, they say, I want you to build me, give me a way to make the material with such and such properties, right? Like, maybe mm. the thing can spit out a specification for such a material, but that doesn't mean you have any idea how to build it. So you're like, all right, tell me how to build a material with these properties, right? Mm. And what you, in fact, wanted was for the system to tell you how to build something with those properties and also not turn the entire Earth into solar panels in order to collect energy to build that stuff. Okay. But you probably didn't think to specify that. And there's yeah. just, like, an infinite list of stuff like that that you would have to specify in order to capture all of the things which you actually want. You're not going to be able to just, like, say them all. Sure. So, so it seems like if we could somehow express don't mess up the world in a crazy <laughs> way, yes. uh, how, how much of, like, what you think of as the alignment problem or the value learning problem would that right. solve? Right. So that gets us to one of the next problems, 
which is, so first of all, we don't currently have a way that we know to robustly say don't mess up the rest of the world, but I expect that that part is like relatively tractable. Like Turner's stuff about uh, average utility preservation, I think would more or less work for that, except for the part where, again, it can't really do anything that interesting. The, the problem with a machine which only does low impact things is that you'll probably not be able to get it to do high impact things. And we do sometimes want to do high impact things. Okay. Yeah. Can Can you describe a task where, like, here's this task that we would want an AI system to do, mm -hmm. and we need to do mm -hmm. like really good value learning or alignment or something even beyond that? Well, let's just go with your material example. So we wanted to give us some material with very bizarre properties. These properties are bizarre enough that uh, you need nano systems to build them, and it takes stupidly large amounts of energy. Okay. So if you are asking an AI to build this stuff, then by default it's going to be doing things to get stupidly large amounts of energy, which is probably going to be pretty big and destructive. If you ask a uh, low-impact AI system to build this, to, yep. to like produce some of this stuff, what it will do is mostly try to make as little of it as possible, because it will have to do some big impact things to make large quantities of it. Yep. So it will mostly just like try to avoid making the stuff as much as possible. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you could imagine we just like ramp up the impact budget, like bit by bit, until we get enough of the material we want, and then we definitely stop. <laughs> <laughs> well, then the question is, how much material do you want, and what do you want it for? Okay. Like, presumably, what you want to do with this material is like go do things in the world, like okay. build new systems in the world that do cool things. The problem is that is itself high impact. You are changing the world in big ways when you go do cool things with this new material. All right. Like, if you're creating new industries off of it, that's a huge impact. And your low-impact machine is going to be actively trying to prevent you from doing that because it is trying to have low impact. Cool. So before you've, you've said that um, you're interested in solving, like, ambitious value learning, mm -hmm. where we just understand, like, everything about humans' preferences, not just, like, don't yeah. mess things up too uh, much. So, is this so why? Like, right out the gate, I'll clarify an important thing there, which is I'm not, like... I'm perfectly happy with things other than ambitious value learning. Like, that is not my exclusive target. I think it is a useful thing to aim for because it sort of most directly forces you to address the hard problems. But, like, there, there's certainly other things we could hit on along the way that would be fine. Like, if, if it turns out that corrigibility is actually a thing, that would be great. Right? What's corrigibility if it's a thing? Go look it up. <laughs> All right. Fine. Daniel, you can tell people what corrigibility is. Okay. <clears throat> so something like getting an AI system to, like, be willing to be corrected by you and let, let you, like, edit its desires and stuff. Yeah. Like, it's, it's trying to help you out without necessarily influencing you. It is trying to, like, help you get what you want. Yeah. It's, it's trying to, like, be nice and helpful without, like, pushing you. Okay. Yeah. And so, yeah, the reason to work on ambitious value learning is just, like, there's nothing we're sweeping under the rug. Yeah. Part of the problem when you're trying for, like, corrigibility or something is that it will be, it makes it a little too easy to, like, delude yourself into thinking you're solving the problem when, in fact, you're ignoring big, hard things. Uh -huh. Whereas with uh, ambitious value learning, like, there's a reason ambitious is right there in the title. It is very clear that there are a bunch of hard things, and they're they're broadly the same hard things that everything else has. It's just sort of more obvious. Okay. And so, how does your work relate to ambitious value learning? Is it something like uh, figure out what abstractions are, then like something profit? Uh, so it ties in in multiple places. One of them is. By and large, humans care about high-level abstract objects, not about low-level quantum fields. Okay. So if you want to understand human values, then like understanding those abstractions is like a clear, useful step, right? Similarly, if we buy the natural abstraction hypothesis, then that like really narrows down which things we might care about, right? Hmm. So there's that angle. Uh, another angle is just using abstraction as a foundation for talking about agency more broadly. Okay. Another value of what? Abstraction is for, or another value of how we of, of, of what how abstraction to do value learning of what abstraction is for. Okay, cool. So, like understanding better understanding agency and what goals are in general, and like how to look at a uh, physical system and figure out what its goals are. Like that's abstraction is a useful building block with, to use for building those models. Okay, cool. Isn't type signature of human values world to reals? What sloppy? What parts are we focusing? Was that? What's 
isn't the type signature of human values just worlds? <laughs> Even if we're taking the pure, you know, Bayesian expected utility maximizer viewpoint, hmm. it is an expected utility maximizer. That does not mean that your inputs are worlds. That means your inputs are human models of world. Like, it is the random variables in your model that are the inputs to the utility function, not whole worlds themselves. You do not, like, the world was made of quantum fields long before human models had any quantum fields in them. Mm. Right? Those clearly cannot be the inputs to, to a human value function. Well, I mean, in expected utility, sorry, uh, in, in the simple expected utility world, if, if I have an AI system that I think has, like, better probabilities than I do, then, mm -hmm. like, uh, if it has the same, like, world-to-reals function, then, like, I'm happy to defer to it, right? What's a world-to-reals? How does it have a world in its, in, its, uh, in its world model? Like, a world model, the ontology of the world model is not the ontology of the world. The variables in the world model do not necessarily correspond to anything in particular in the world. Well, I mean... They, they kind you, of correspond to things in the world, If you buy right? the natural abstraction hypothesis, that would give you a reason to expect that some variables in the world model correspond to some things in the world. But, like, that's not a thing you get for free just from, like, having an expected utility maximizer. Okay. So, next I want to talk a little bit about how you interact with the research landscape. Okay. So, you're an independent researcher, right? Yep. I'm wondering, like, how... Yeah, which parts of AI alignment do you think fit best with independent research and which parts like don't fit with it very well? So the right now de facto answer is that like most of the substantive research in AI alignment fits best with independent research. Like academia is mostly going to steer you towards like doing sort of bullshitty things that are easier to publish. And the there's like what, three orgs in the space? Uh, Miri is kind of on ice at the moment. Redwood is doing like mildly interesting empirical things, but not even attempting to tackle core problems. Uh, Anthropic is doing some mildly interesting things, but not even attempting to tackle core problems. Like, if you want to tackle the core problems, then independent research is clearly the way to go right now. That does not mean that like there there's structural reasons for independent research to be the right sort of route for this sort of thing. All right. So like as as time goes forward, sooner or later the field is going to become more paradigmatic. And the more that happens, the less independent research is going to be like structurally favored. Uh, but even now, there are like parts of the problem where you can do parad more paradigmatic things and there working at an organization makes more sense. All right. And, and so when you say like this distinction between core problems that maybe independent research is best and non-core mm -hmm. problems that other people are working on, what's that division in your head? So the the core problems are things like uh, sort, sort of like the conceptual stuff we've been talking about. Like right now, we don't even know what are the key questions to ask about alignment. We still don't really understand what agency is mathematically or any of the like adjacent concepts within that cluster. Hmm. Uh, and as long as we don't know any of those things, we don't really have any idea how to make, like robustly design an AI that will do a thing we want, right? Okay. Like we're at the stage where we don't know which questions we need to ask in, in order to do that. And when I talk about tackling the core problems, I'm mostly talking about like research directions which will plausibly get us to the point where we know which questions we need to ask or which things we even need to do in order to robustly build an AI which does what we want. All right. So, yeah, one, one thing here is that it seems like you've ended up with this outlook, especially on the on the question of like what the core problems are, that's relatively mm -hmm. close to that of uh, Mary, yep. the Machine Intelligence Research Institute. Uh, you don't work at Mary. My understanding is that you didn't like grow up there in some sense. What is your relationship to that thought world? So I've definitely had like I was exposed to the sequences back in back in college ten years ago, and I followed Mary's work for for a number of years after that. Uh, I went to the Mary Summer Fellows Program in 2019, so I've had like a fair bit of exposure to it. It's not like it's not like I, I was just evolved completely independently. Okay. But it's still, like, e even, even correct, like, there's lots of other people who have followed Miri to about the same extent that I have and un have not converged to similar views to nearly the same extent, right? Okay. Uh, including plenty of Miri employees, even. It's a very heterogeneous organization. Okay. 
So what do you mean by Miri Views if Miri is such a heterogeneous organization? I mean, I, I think when people say Miri Views, they're mostly talking about like uh, Yudkowsky's views, uh, Nate's views, the, those, those pretty heavily overlap. Okay. Uh, a few other people, the, the Agent Foundations team is relatively similar to those. All right. uh, yeah. So a lot of people have followed Miri's output and read mm -hmm. the sequences, but didn't end up with uh, Miri's views, including many people in Miri. Yeah. I assume that's because they're they're all defective somehow and do not understand things at all. I don't know, man. I'm being sarcastic. All right, yeah, we can't. Daniel, Daniel can see this from my face. Help. But yeah, uh, I think I. So part of this, I think, is about sort of how I came to the problem. Like I came through these sort of biology and economics problems, which were. Actually, let me back up. Talk about how other people come to the problem. All right. uh, so I think a lot of people start out with like just just starting at the top. Like, how do we align an AI? How do we get an AI to do things that we want robustly, right? Hmm. Uh, and if you're starting from there, you have to like play down through a few layers of the game tree before you start to realize what the main bottlenecks to solving the problem are. Okay. Whereas I was I was coming from this this different direction from like biology and economics where I had already like gone a layer or two down those game trees and seen what those hard problems were. Mm -hmm. So when I was looking at AI, I was like, ah, this is clearly going to run into the the same hard bottlenecks, right? Okay. And sure. It's, it's mostly about like going down the game tree deep enough to see what those key bottlenecks are. Okay. And you think that like. Uh... Yeah, so somehow people who didn't end up with this these views, do you think they like went down a different leg of the tree? Or I think like... most of them just like haven't gone down that many layers of the tree yet. Like most people in this field are still pretty new in absolute terms, okay. uh, like, and it, it does take time to like play down the game tree. Uh, and I do think the longer people are in the field, the more they tend to converge to a similar view. Okay. So, for instance, example of that uh, right now. Uh, myself, Scott Garibrandt, and Paul Cristiano are all working on basically the same problem. Uh -huh. it's, it's, we're, we're all basically working on what is abstraction or like what, where does the human ontology come from, that sort of thing. Sure. And that was very much a case of convergent evolution. We all came from extremely different directions. Uh -huh. Yeah, speaking of these adjacent fields, I'm wondering, so you mentioned uh, biology and economics. Are there any other ones that are like sources of inspiration? Uh, so biology, economics, and AI or ML are the big three. Okay. I know some people draw similar kinds of inspiration from neuroscience. I personally haven't spent that much time looking into neuroscience, but like, I, it's it's certainly an area where you can end up with similar intuitions. And also, complex systems theorists run into similar things to some extent. Okay. So I expect that a lot of listeners to the show will be like pretty familiar with AI, maybe less familiar with um, biology or economics. Mm -hmm. Who are the people, or what are the like lines of research that you think are really worth following there? So I don't think there's no one that immediately jumps out as like the 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 person in economics or in biology who is like clearly asking the analogous questions to what we're doing here. Okay, I would say. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't have like a, a clear good person. Like, there are people who do like good work in terms of understanding the systems, but it's not really about like fundamentally getting what's going on with the agency. Okay. Another. Okay, I'm gonna wrap back a bit. And another question right. about uh, being an independent researcher. Mm -hmm. In non-independent research, there's like, you know, it's run by organizations, and the organizations are thinking about creating like useful infrastructure to have their researchers yep. do good stuff. I imagine. This might be a deficit in the independent research landscape. So, firstly, what existing infrastructure like do you think is pretty useful, and what infrastructure like could potentially exist that would be super useful? Yeah. So the obvious big ones currently are less wrong slash the alignment forum uh, and the light cone offices, and okay. now actually also the constellation offices to some extent, which are offices in Berkeley where some people work. Yep. So that's. Obviously, hugely valuable infrastructure uh, for me personally. Things that could exist. The the big bottleneck right now is just like getting more independent researchers to the point where they can do useful independent research in alignment. Hmm. Uh, like, there's a lot of people who'd like to do this, but they don't really know what to do or where to start. If I'm thinking more about like what would be useful for me personally, 
there's, there's definitely a lot of space to have like people focused on distillation, like full time figuring out what's going on with uh, various researchers' ideas and trying to write them up in, in more easily communicated forms. So okay. a, a big part of uh, my own success has been like being able to do that pretty well myself. Uh, but even then, it's still pretty time intensive, and certainly there are other researchers who are not good at doing it themselves. And it's helpful both for them and for me, as someone reading their work, to have somebody else come along and you know more clearly explain what's going on. Sure. So going back a little bit to um, upcoming researchers who like mm-hmm. uh, trying to figure out how to get to a place where they can do useful stuff. Yep. Concretely, what do you think is needed there? Yeah, that's that's something I've been working on a fair bit lately is trying to figure out what exactly is needed. So there's a lot of currently not very legible skills that go into uh, doing this sort of pre-paradigmatic research. Obviously, the problem with them not being legible is, like, I can't necessarily give you a very good explanation of what they are, right? Yeah, yeah. To some extent, there are ways of, like, getting around that. Like if you're uh, working closely with someone who has these skills, then you can sort of pick them up. I I wrote a post recently arguing that a big reason to study physics is that physicists in particular seem to have a bunch of illegible epistemic skills, which somehow get passed on to new physicists, but like nobody really seems to make them legible along the way. Hmm. And then of course there's like people like me trying to figure out what some of these skills are and just directly make them more legible. Uh, So for instance, I was working with my apprentice recently, just like doing some math. And I asked him, at one point I paused and asked him, uh, all right, sketch for me the picture in your head that corresponds to that math you just wrote down. And he was like, wait, picture in my head? What? And I was Mm. like, ah, that's an important skill. We're going to have to install that one. Like when you're doing some math, you want to be act, like have a picture in your head of like the prototypical example of the thing that the math is saying. And that's like a, a very like crucial load bearing skill. Yeah, yeah. So then like did a few exercises on that, and like within a, a week or two, there was a very noticeable improvement as a result of that. Right. Okay. But that's an example of the sort of thing. But sure. It's it's not it's not very legible, but like it's it's extremely important for being able to do the work well. Okay. Another question I'd like to ask is about the field of AI alignment. I'm wondering, at some point, I believe you, you've said that you think that at some point in like five to ten years, it's going to kind of get its act together. There's going to be some kind of phase transition yeah. where things get easier. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about like why you think that will happen and what's well, going on the there? Well, obvious, the obvious starting point here is that I'm trying to make it happen. Okay. Uh, so there's... It's it's an interesting problem trying to like like set the foundations for a paradigm mm. right, for paradigmatic work. It's an interesting problem because you have to kind of like play the game at two separate levels. Mm. There there's a technical component where you have to have the right technical results in order to 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 like support this kind of work. But then at the same time, you want to be pursuing the kinds of technical results which will provide legible ways for lots of other people to contribute. So you want to kind of be optimizing for both of those things simultaneously. Uh, and this is, for instance, uh, the selection theorems thing, despite the bad marketing. Uh, this was exactly what it was aiming for. And I've already seen some success with that. Like I'm currently mentoring an AI safety camp team, which is working on the, the modularity thing. Okay. And it's going extremely well. Like they have a very they've been they've been turning around real fast. They have a great iterative feedback loop going where like they they have some idea of how to formulate modularity or what sort of modularity they would see or why. They go test it in an actual neural network. Uh, it inevitably fails. The theorists go back to the drawing board. And it's a clear idea of what they're aiming for. There's a clear idea of what success looks like, or a reasonably clear idea of what success looks like. And they're able to like work on it very, very quickly and effectively. That said, I like I don't think the selection theorems thing is actually going to be the, what, what makes this phase change happen longer term, but it's sort of a, a stopgap, I guess. So, so what like like is the idea that um, the natural abstraction hypothesis gets solved, mm-hmm. and then what happens? So that would be one path. There's more than one possible path here, but like if the natural abstraction hypothesis is is solved real well, 
you could imagine that we have a legible idea of what good abstractions are. So then we can tell people, like, go find some good abstractions for X, Y, Z, right? Like uh -huh. agency or optimization or uh, uh, world models or information or what have you, right? Mm. If we have a legible notion of what abstractions are, then it's much more clear how to go looking for those things, what the criteria are for success, whether you've actually found the thing or not. And those are the key pieces you need in order for lots of people to go tackle the problem independently, right? Those are the foundational things for a paradigm. Cool. Yeah, I guess wrapping up, if people listen to this podcast and they're interested in you and your work, yeah, how can they follow your writings and stuff? They should go on less wrong. All right. And how do they find you? You can go to the search bar and type John S. Wentworth into the search bar. Alternatively, you can just look at the front page, and I will probably have a post on the front page at any given time. All right. I will say John S. Wentworth as the author. Cool, cool. Well, thanks for joining me on this show. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, to the listeners, I hope this was valuable. This episode is edited by Jack Garrett. The opening and closing themes are also by Jack Garrett. The financial costs of making this episode are covered by a grant from the Long-Term Future Fund. To read a transcript of this episode, or to learn how to support the podcast, you can visit axerp.net. Finally, if you have any feedback about this podcast, you can email me at feedback at axerp.net. Mm -hmm.